They claim the soul Bible has outlived its day. That there are some changes that need to be made. Let no man to see. Take your Bible or turn with me to Matthew 24. Truth is determined by the test of time. Trust in your Bible with the days and nights. Never mind those people who want to let out. Churches are drifting and falling away. We need the same more than ever today. Good evening. Welcome to Empty Cross Ministries Wednesday Night Bible Study. <clears throat> I'm Brother David, and I'm going to be your host and fellow student for the next 30 to 45 minutes. The name of the program is King James Version Exposed. That is KJV Exposed. We use the King James Version, and we look at each verse, break it down, bring it to life, and expose the meaning and show how God's Word is relevant and applicable to our lives today. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Then we're going to jump down and look at verses 30 through 35 of Luke chapter 24. We haven't been on for a while, been having some uh, illnesses in the family. We uh, had a death in the family. That's why I haven't been on for a while. But we're back up and running now. And we're going to get back in the swing of things here. How do we find the strength to go on during the most difficult of times? We might wish we were the victim of a mere April Fool's Day joke only to realize our problems are quite real. Many find encouragement from a proverb of English theologian and historian Thomas Fuller and his Apigsa site of Palestine and the confines thereof. Fuller wrote, It is always darkest just before the day dawneth. Two centuries later, Irish songwriter Samuel Lover remarked that this saying had become proverbial amongst the Irish peasantry to inspire hope under adverse circumstances. Today, the same words are used by therapists, self-help gurus, and motivational speakers. Don't give up is their message. Better times are ahead. We have all experienced dark times that we thought would never end, yet they did end. The crucifixion of Jesus was such a dark time, but it was dispelled by the brightness of the resurrection. Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23 verse 54 is clear that Jesus was crucified and buried on the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. Look also at Matthew chapter 27, verse 62, Mark chapter 15, verse 42, the Gospel of John chapter 19, verses 14, 31, and 42. Luke chapter 23, verse 56, further indicates that the women prepared spices and ointments on the day of preparation so as not to violate the Sabbath. Mark chapter 16 verse 1 states that the spices were for anointing Jesus' body. And the Gospel of John chapter 19 verses 39 and 40 demonstrates the Jews' burial custom of wrapping a body in linen clothes and spices. This was not an easy task, at least in the case of Jesus, as the Gospel of John chapter 19 verse 39 reveals use of about 100 Roman pounds, about 75 modern pounds of myrrh and owls. <clears throat> and what we're going to do now is we're going to read the entire text, then we'll go back Look at, look at the entire text verse by verse and break each verse down. 
bring it to life, and expose the meaning, and show how God's Word is applicable and relevant in our lives today. So if you haven't already, grab your Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to start in verses 1 through 12, and then jump down to verses 30 through 35. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 1 now. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices with the, which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in, and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulchre, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter, and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Now we're going to jump down to verses 30 through 35. <clears throat> and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, and blessed it, and brake it, and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us, while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour, and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. Our key verse is Luke chapter 24, verse 34, and it reads, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. He is risen, he is risen indeed. The first section of our scripture could be titled, The Witness of the Women. The focus of Luke chapter 24 on the witness of certain women has Luke chapter 23, 50, verses 50 through 56, as its point of departure. What follows presupposes that the women knew the location of the sepulchre. Indeed, they did, because they had watched Joseph of Aramea place Jesus' body there. Compare this with Matthew chapter 27, verse 61. The same is not said of any of the remaining eleven apostles, although, although at least two of them seem to know exactly where the sepulchre is. Look at John chapter 20, verses 3 and 4. Verse 1 could be subtitled, Prepared with Spices. Verse 1, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. The first day of the week is Sunday. The day of preparation is Friday, and the Sabbath is Saturday, and they are all past. They, they refers to the women from Luke chapter 23, verses 55 and 56 combining the observation that it is now very early in the morning with the sunset to sunset understanding of transition from one day to the next leaves no doubt that this is the third day regarding the spices which they have prepared go back and listen to what I said in the background for the lesson 
Verse 2. They were unprepared for the scene that they were about to uncover. Verse 2. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. Archaeologists have uncovered hundreds of tombs within three miles of Jerusalem. Many have stones that can be rolled away like the one mentioned here. Mark chapter 16 verse 4 records that the stone over Jesus' sepulchre was very great. And since limestone weighs about 170 pounds per cubic foot, even a stone of moderate size means substantial weight. If the stone is three feet in diameter and one foot thick, the resulting volume of seven cubic feet comp computes to a weight of about 1,200 pounds. A stone four feet across would weigh over a ton. Verse 3, And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Jesus' missing body is the central dramatic element of Luke chapter 24. Luke stresses this as he builds to the climax of his gospel in order to establish that Jesus' body is missing for a reason. <clears throat> We're going to look at verses 4 and 5 together. Actually, verses 4 through 8 could be subtitled, An Angelic Explanation. Okay, verses 4 and 5. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid, and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? The woman's confusion about the missing body doesn't last long as it gives way to fear. The two men who elicit the fear are expressly identified as angels in Luke chapter 24 verse 23. Also look at John chapter 20 verse 12, Matthew chapter 28 verse 2, and Mark chapter 16 verse 5 mention just one angel, likely because the focus is on the speaker only. Fear at the appearance of an angel is apparent in the writings of Luke. Look at Luke chapter 1 verses 11, 12, and 29, Luke chapter 2 verse 9, and Acts chapter 10 verses 3 and 4. And other appearances Angels tell people not to fear, but here there is no such admonition. The woman's response of bowing appears to be instinctual. Abraham reacted the same way to the three men in Genesis chapter 18 verse 2 as did Lot regarding the two angels in Genesis chapter 19 verse 1. Bowing also seems to be a common act of respect for authority in the ancient Near East as seen in Genesis chapter 33 verse 3, Genesis chapter 42 verse 6, and in Ruth chapter 2 verse 10. The angel's concluding question is valid but incomprehensible to the women. The women have not yet seen Jesus alive and they do not expect to. Even so, a hint to the mystery of the missing body is embedded in the angel's question. And I need to get a drink here real quick. <clears throat> Brings me to a what do you think question. What do you think? How can we ensure we relate to Jesus as a living Lord and not as a long dead historical figure? What about in the form and content of our prayers? What about in how we talk about Him? What about considering the degree to which we keep His commandments? We now come to verse 6. He is not here. It is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. The angels state the most important fact in all of history when they declare the reason for the absence of Jesus' body, that he is risen. Then the angels give the woman a command to remember the words of Jesus while he was still with them in Galilee. These verses form the beginning of a poetic sandwich using the word remember. 
we can we can note in passing the curious fact that Jesus' enemies remember his prediction of rising from the dead, but his followers do not. Because I promised. A friend and his wife celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary not long ago. The husband admitted in a touching tribute that the years together had not been without struggle. Marriage has been hard sometimes, much harder than we expected, he said. Despite the difficulties they experienced, they stayed together. After one extended difficult patch... I asked my wife why she stayed. I didn't like your answer, because I promised. I thought she'd say something about my charm and my being a good guy under it all. But it was nothing about me. It was about the promise. On our wedding day, she said she would. Reading this, I thought about the times in my own marriage when things had been less than what I thought they'd be. During those times, I often remembered the day I stood before all my family and friends, before God, and before my wife had promised to love her even when it was hard. That promise we made holds us together. It trickles down to our children who live under the umbrella of that bond. As my friend so aptly put it, keeping a promise requires more of us. It makes us better. And receiving a promise is a gift. It brings priceless sense of security. God promised that a Savior would come, and God kept that promise. Then Jesus promised that he would rise again, and he did. Is it not glorious to serve a promise-keeping God? We now come to verse 7. Saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man and be crucified, and the third day rise again. This verse is the center of the, ver of the verbal sandwich begun in verse 6. The angels remind the women of the words of Jesus that they should not have forgotten in the first place. These, the most critical of Jesus' words, have been lost to conscious thought, possibly because Jesus' followers did not wish to believe them. Compare this with Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 and 22. We now come to verse 8. And they remembered his words. This is the conclusion of the verbal sandwich begun in verse 6. The sequence says something. The first encounter on this, the third day, is not between the risen Jesus and the woman. Rather, the first encounter is with angels who bear an imperative to remember his words. We do well to apply this imperative to our lives daily. Brings me to another what do you think question. How do lives focused on the resurrection differ from those that are not? What about regarding the outlook on sin? What about regarding the outlook on suffering? What about regarding the outlook on salvation? Just think about those things. We now come to verse 9. Verses 9 through 12 could be titled Apostolic Disbelief. Okay, verse 9. And returned from the sepulchre, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. The return of the woman to Jerusalem echoes the previous return in Luke chapter 23, verse 56. But this time, the reason is quite the opposite. Instead of, instead of preparing spices to anoint the dead body of Jesus, they return with the message of the live body of Jesus. Mention of the eleven highlights the fact that these are the twelve of Luke 22, Verse 47, minus Judas, the betrayer. Verses 10 and 11 now. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Luke indicates there are at least five women involved, with three being named Mary Magdalene, is recorded by the Gospels as being present at the crucifixion of Jesus, at his burial, and at the empty tomb early Sunday morning. She was delivered from demon possession by Jesus, 
which helps us understand her devotion to him. Joanna is the wife of an official in the household of Herod, of Herod, the king of Galilee. Mary, the mother of James, is further defined as being the mother of James and Joseph in Matthew chapter 27, verse 56. This may be Matthew's way of referring to Mary, the mother of Jesus, for she had sons named James and Joseph. We see that in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. It would be odd, however, that Jesus' mother would not be identified as such at this point rather than by the names of two of Jesus' half-brothers. So it is more likely that the Marian view here is a different woman from Galilee. In any case, these women are followers of Jesus, but that is not enough to make their account of the empty tomb credible to the rest. Instead, those gathered, including the apostles, dismiss their story as idle tales. Compare this with Acts chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. We can imagine the disappointment and hurt these faithful women must feel at not being believed. Brings me to another what do you think question. How can we prepare to respond to those who struggle to believe in the resurrection? What about regarding awareness of sleep presuppositions? Here's some scriptures. Acts 17, verse 31 and 32. Acts 23, verses 6 through 8. Acts 26, verse 8. What about regarding the context of the interaction? Here's some scriptures. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 36. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Acts chapter 13, verses 41, verses 14 through 41. What about regarding our demeanor when challenged? Remember, folks, we are to speak the truth in love. Okay. We now come to verse 12. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen cloths lay, laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. This section of the account began with the women returning to the eleven apostles, but it ends with a focus on only one of them, Peter. The biblical record is clear that he is a key figure among the apostles, and especially in the resurrection accounts. In Mark chapter 16, verse 7, the angel specifically instructs the women to tell Peter that Jesus is going to Galilee, and the apostles will see him there. The fact that he is wondering in himself at that which was come to pass indicates that he needs a reminder of Jesus' words just as much as the women did. We now come to the second section of our scripture, and it can be titled, Epiphany at Emmaus. Okay. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 29, sets the stage for the next segment. Jesus has appeared unrecognized to two disciples on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. The nature of the conversation and the fading of daylight impels the two to invite the incognito Jesus to remain with them. But before everyone turns in for the night, a meal is shared. Verse 30. Instant awareness. Okay, And it came to pass, as he set up meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. Contexts of meals, eating and drinking are important vehicles for portraying kingdom truths in Luke's gospel. Meal times in this gospel are dramatic and suspenseful. Concerning the case at hand, the drama has been building since Luke chapter 24 verse 13, with the climax now unfolding. The similarity between Jesus' actions in this verse and his earlier actions in Luke 22 verse 19 are intriguing. There Jesus took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them in instituting the Lord's Supper. Does Jesus intend the current situation to be a reminder of the previous Three factors suggest the answer is no. First, Jesus had said that he will not anymore eat thereof 
until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That's Luke chapter 22, verse 16. Second, no cup is mentioned. Compare this with uh, Luke chapter 22, verses 17 and verse 20. Third, the blessing and breaking of bread was not something unique to the Last Supper. Look at Matthew chapter 14, verse 19. We now come to verse 31. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. On the other hand, some students say that a certain link with the Lord's Supper is suggested by the fact that Jesus' dining companions are able to recognize him as soon as Jesus gives them bread. Recalling that Luke chapter 22 verse 19 has Jesus distributing bread as he says, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Up to this point in Luke chapter 24, Jesus' body has been missing or otherwise kept from being recognized. This is the point in Luke's resurrection account where that changes. An interplay of physical and spiritual blindness may also be intended by Luke. Jesus' two hosts for the meal are men whose eyes have been holden that they should not know him. That's Luke chapter 24, verse 16. Concurrently, they had received a tongue lashing from Jesus, who called them fools and slow of heart to believe. Luke, that's Luke chapter 24, verse 25. The suggested connection is that the lifting of their spiritual blindness had to happen before they were able to recognize Jesus physically. The gospel message includes Jesus proclaiming recovering of sight to the blind. We see that in Luke chapter 4 verse 18. This is not limited to those who are physically unable to see. It is also, and more importantly, addresses the need of those who lack spiritual awareness. We now come to verse 32. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? The expression of heartburn here does not refer to indigestion, but rather to a sense of longing or excitement that comes by learning truth. We should notice the sequence. First, the correcting of the deficient understanding of the scripture while on the road to Emmaus was accompanied by burning hearts. Secondly, that correction in turn has led to, to the ability to recognize Jesus and now thirdly, the two disciples comprehend the connection between the first one and the second one. Brings me to another what do you think question. What do you think? How can we maintain hunger for God's word? What about regarding positive thoughts and behaviors to reinforce? What about regarding negative thoughts and behaviors to eliminate? Let's think on those things. We now come to verse 35. The return to Jerusalem. I'm sorry, it's verse 33. The return to Jerusalem. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. The general designation Two of them, in Luke chapter 24, verse 13, leaves open the possibility that the one who is unnamed is an apostle. It is read as a direct continuation of Luke 24, verses 9 through 12. That possibility is negated by the fact that these two men find the eleven gathered together in Jerusalem. The action of and reporting by the two men bears similarities to those of the women in Luke chapter 24, verse 9. Although the day is far spent, they have the light of the nearly full moon by which to walk since the feast of Passover, recently completed, occurs during the full moon. They cannot wait until morning to share their experience, so they scurry the seven miles back to Jerusalem. We now come to verse 34. The resurrection is confirmed. Verse 34, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. 
The man returned to Jerusalem, only to hear from the eleven and the others what they now already believe and have experienced, that the Lord is risen indeed. This is the focus of all accounts in Luke chapter 24 and the central idea of what is commonly called Easter today. Statement parallels in Luke 24 from a certain long standard long-standing Easter tradition in churches. In Luke chapter 24, verse 9, the women pass along the angelic claim that Jesus is risen. Now some or all those in Jerusalem affirm the Lord is risen indeed. In many services today, a worship leader will declare, He is risen, to which the congregation responds, He is risen indeed. Those gathered also confirm that the Lord has appeared to Simon. This is Peter's other name. He is also known as Cephas. But wait, why isn't this described here? When Peter last appears in Luke chapter 24, verse 12, the Lord has not appeared to him. Now we read that he has. Is something missing? The short answer is no. Like all careful historians, Luke chooses what to include and what not to, what not to. Each gospel makes its unique contribution to detail. Brings me to another what do you think question. What do you think? How can we encourage each other in our faith in the risen Lord? What about when non-believers mock our faith? What about when the pressures of life seem heaviest? You know, in the early days of the United States, rugged settlers braved the unknown to explore beyond the Appalachian Mountains. One such was James Herod, who trapped and traded in what later would become Kentucky. Eventually, he helped found a settlement in 1774 that became known as Herodsburg. Over the years, Herod married and had a family. He became involved in politics and farming and grew wealthy. He also used his skills to help the military periodically. But Herod became increasingly solitary, sometimes taking long trips into the wilderness alone. He disappeared on one such trip, leaving behind a wife, daughter, and stepson. His family searched for him, and many theories regarding his disappearance evolved. Some people said they saw him alive, and that he even told them he planned to return home eventually. Some said he went back to his secret life and family in the wilderness. Others said he had been killed by Indians. His daughter claimed a fellow hunter had murdered him and hidden the body. But nobody but nobody was ever discovered, and all trails eventually went cold. James Herod lived a life of distinction, but when he disappeared, he did not return. The life Jesus lived was more distinctive by far. He did return from the grave, and he promised to return again from heaven. His resurrection proves him to be more than just a unique leader. He is far more. We now come to verse 35. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. This verse serves as a, transi as a transition to Jesus' appearance in verse 36. It is also a summary statement of all that has happened to the two men from Luke chapter 24, verse 13 until now. Jesus' body was missing from the tomb, but found when he was known of them and breaking of bread, with bread perhaps serving to represent Jesus' body. The main focus of the drama of Luke chapter 24. He is risen. He is risen indeed. <clears throat> Although many Christians say he is risen to one another only at Easter, there are some churches where Christians greet each other regularly with he is risen. This practice reminds them that the body of Jesus is missing from the tomb for a reason. Because he is risen now and forever. This should be remembered daily, not just at Easter. The resurrection of Christ has daily implications consisting of both blessings and responsibilities for all believers. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
thank you for keeping your promises by raising Jesus from the dead. Help us to trust you more because you are trustworthy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close out tonight, I leave you with this thought to remember. No darkness can overshadow the sun. The sun being S-O-N. No darkness can overshadow the sun. Oh. Okay. Stay tuned next. Uh, stay tuned next week at the same time here on Speaker. Tell all your friends, your contacts to tune in and join us for our Empty Cross Ministries Wednesday night Bible study. <clears throat> you hear me flipping through pages. I lost the paper. But that's all right. Again, stay tuned next week and we'll be looking at the Gospel of John. And we'll be talking about the risen Lord once again. And we're going to close out with the same song we opened with. It's called This Old Bible. And I think I'm going to let it play to the end. Again, this has been Brother David with Empty Cross Ministries Wednesday Night Bible Study. The name of the program is KJ The Exposed. It's King James Version Exposed. Stay safe. Be blessed. Stay in the Word. And write the Word upon your heart. They claim the soul Bible as I hope we'll get stay. That there are some changes that we can make. But no fantasy. Make your Bible for a change. Turn with me to Matthew your Bible. Truth is determined by the test of time. Because the Bible will be the night. Never mind the people who want to to the 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 Oh, what the children I will find this changing, and people don't care. The signs of the end they see everywhere. Trust the old Bible and stays in love. Never mind those people who want to live out. Churches are drifting and falling away. We are so good for the They criticize the line and then find dirty things. Some say it's a fear, some say it's a fear, not the one. They try to replace it and shove it aside. But God is in soft, He said He will abide. Trust the old Bible with its fears and bounds. Never mind those people who want to live out. Churches are drifting and falling away. We need a soul for the heaven today. Jesus is coming to the other side. He will determine whose heart is wrong. The Bible is sacred, holy and wrong. And those who defile it, oh, where will they stand? Trust the old Bible with fears and bounds. Never mind those people who want to live out. Churches are drifting and falling away. 